Ed Transformed is brought to you by School of the Future International Academy, in short, SOFIA. SOFIA is a non-profit, non-governmental organization which supports educational institutions, school leaders and educators to improve their knowledge and skills. This way, they will be able to contribute to the creation of equal opportunities for every student. This is a series of podcasts where we try to open up discussions on various topics that interest the modern educational community. Today, we are honored and very, very excited to have with us Kerry Goldstein, Director of Owning Programs in Cultures of Dignity. And we will speak about how to create the school environments of dignity, create the school environments of dignity vs. school environments of respect. So hi, Kerry. Welcome in at Transformed. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Would you like to speak to us a little bit about your organization before we uh, start discussing about our main topic? Yeah, that would be great. And, um, in the United States, that was founded by Rosalind Wiseman and Charlie Kuhn probably five or six years ago. Um, and it incorporates, we have a curriculum called Owning Up that we use, mm -hmm. at, uh, use within schools. Uh, we also have things called Tiny Guides that we use in schools as well. But we, we use in schools as well. But we also work with um, bigger organizations and parents, school districts, individuals, mm -hmm. types of things to talk about um, how to create cultures of dignity and how to draw attention to the need for social emotional learning. Um, mm -hmm. We all are hearing more about that now, but we've, but we've been trying to do this for a while. Um, so we work with schools and try to partner with them mostly, uh, but then also other bigger organizations. Perfect. Shall we start? Um, what is the main difference between establishing cultures of respect and establishing cultures of dignity in schools? And we get that a lot because when we go into schools, respect is such a word that is on walls and schools across the mm -hmm. world. What's so really everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And we don't ever want From to say From kindergarten that. to yes. high school. Yes, everywhere. And it's not a word that we necessarily say is bad. Uh, we just think maybe it gets used or overused in the wrong way, uh, in the wrong way. Because um, respect really means, you know, it's from the Latin word respectus to look back at. Um, and so respect is earned, whereas dignity mm -hmm. is from the Latin word dignitas, which means to be worthy. Uh, we feel that dignity is given, you know, everyone has inherent worth and nobody has more or less than anybody else. Um, mm -hmm. So Type of culture or dignity in our head a little bit shifts it from respect me just because, or I am the adult, I am the elder, you know, those words that we've sort of grown up with and phrases of you respect someone simply because they're in a position. Whereas a lot of times, as we've seen across the world, people in those positions sometimes, as we've seen across the world, people in those positions sometimes abuse those positions of power mm -hmm. or control. Whereas dignity is more about, um, feeling seen, heard, uh, just recognized for your inherent worth and what you bring to the table and to the school. So we think it can shift the relationships between adults and young people in, to make it a more uh, uh, workable community. I, I often have to get up there quickly with teachers and say, we're not saying that um, there still shouldn't be rules or kids shouldn't be held accountable, but it's kind of how we work through those processes and mm -hmm. processes and um, work with kids and treating them a little bit of a different way. difference between the two when you explain it to them? They do, it's funny, I had, um, I was working with a school in Colorado, a boarding school, and there was a girl that was out there that was from the South. And she was like, wait, you know, she said, that's how I was raised. And because in the South in the United States, it's very much you respect your elders and, you know, don't talk back. In the United States, it's very much you respect your elders and, you know, don't talk back and things like that. She really, she was kind of joked, like, you're blowing my mind with this and it's going to take <laughs> a while to shift. Um, but kids get it because a lot of times we misuse the word respect in schools. Again, we feel like it can be thought of as more of obey. I'm this adult figure even though I may not have been treating you with dignity, I still, you know, I've still earned it because I'm just in this position. And in particular with kids that are often marginalized in our educational system, mm -hmm. they really feel it as just, you obey me just because. So we feel the shift to dignity creates a conversation. It creates a conversation. It creates, uh, in some ways, a more restorative practice. Kids are always going to mess up. You know, when yes. I, I was in schools for a long time, I was a school counselor for 15 years and 
we, you know, instilled a lot of programs and things like that. And I kept having to remind people, we're not trying to erase discipline issues of make them uh, set kids up for success and all of those things, of course. But we're also talking about human beings that are developmentally should be making mistakes at these ages. Mm-hmm. Do we want the mistake smaller and maybe not life altering <laughs> and things like that? Yes. Um, and these programs help. So a lot of this is also about what happens when they make the mistake. How do we mm-hmm. get them through the mistake? How do we restore that relationship with the school and with the community and with each other? Um, and treating somebody with dignity is how we look at that's possible. I have a good friend of mine's had a son who's really struggled. Uh, he does mm-hmm. not really love authority. <laughs> and that's okay. That's there are some kids that are like that. I mean, an example of her school. And I thought, wow, that was a great example of dignity. And what it was is he had kind of gotten in trouble all day. It was one of those. He had the wrong shirt in the morning. Somebody had gotten on him, and then the principal said something to him finally at the end of the day again, you know, kind of that third person in the day, and he just kind of hung his head, and I think he muttered something like, okay, you're just another human, or, you know, kind of, he didn't say uh-huh. anything respectful, but just kind of muttered like, you're kind of another person getting on me. Uh-huh. And so the principal kind of overheard that, and she really could have taken one of two paths in my mind is sometimes when a kid mutters, we, you know, what did you say to me? You know, we kind of take that authority Role, but what she did role, but what she did is she heard what he said and she let him go in that moment. And then the next day she emailed the mom and said, Look, I had this experience. I want to let you know I'm gonna touch base with him tomorrow because I don't want that to be our sole experience together yesterday. And mm-hmm. so she talked to him the next day and said, Tell me more about that comment. And they had a conversation and he still was held accountable. Now we have to kind of have these rules in place when you're dealing mm-hmm. with large buildings and large groups of people inside those buildings. But they got to this other place of treating him with dignity. Like his feelings matter. His feelings, he was having a really bad day and she was one more person piling on. And as adults, we don't like that either. You know, like we more person piling on. And as adults, we don't like that either. You know, like we exactly. don't uh, feel, want to be kicked when we're down as well. And so I thought, wow, that could have really taken that other path of you respect me and don't mutter under your breath and you wear the shirt that you're supposed to. And of course, he should be wearing the correct shirt and he will be next time, but he's more likely to be wearing the correct shirt and he will be next time, but he's more likely to do it now that she had the conversation with him rather Mm -hmm. than just kind of, these are the rules because, and I'm the adult and you listen to me. And so that's kind of those shifts where we think it could really help school environment. You're actually helping kids perform better. You're helping them feel more at home, their homework. They understand that the adults care about them. They feel seen, they feel heard, they feel valued, which is what schools are set up to do. You know, that's why we exist is to educate, but also educate and also care for, you know, they're with us Mm -hmm. a lot in those schools throughout the day. Definitely. It's very, very important that definitely it's very, very important that they learn that everybody is entitled to be treated with, um, they they have their dignity. So they, you need to treat them the best possible way just I suppose they they bring it to their classmates as well like apart from the relationship yeah I was gonna say with that adult relationship of what what we're modeling for them you know we're have to Mm -hmm. be modeling that and then also with the classmates um they're at a place also where they make poor choices about how they treat each other sometimes and (laughs) uh, people always ask me you know how how can we kind of stop bullying or you know I was like well I would you know be a bazillionaire if I knew that I would you know, be a bazillionaire if I knew that. And I would have written a book a long time ago. <laughs> so there's not really one way um, to stop it. I do think kids, when they feel safer, they don't act out as much or they aren't as uh, mean to other children when they feel socially safe, emotionally safe in the building. And also, of course, physically safe, uh, obviously. And so we look at dignity again is we kind of, we use a curriculum called Owning Up Curriculum. And it's a lot of conversations we look at young people as experts in their own lives. So we don't try to go mm-hmm. in and talk to them and tell them what's happening in their life. We ask them the questions, you know, tell me what's happening in your life. Or or I would laugh, you know, the lesson on technology. I have no idea how they use technology. It's completely different each year, you know, year to year. And it's different yes. for me. And so, it, you know, you kind of say, talk to me about how you use it. Okay, now let's talk about, and then you can pepper in the, well, how does that, do you like it? What do you not like about it? And if you don't like that piece, like that piece, what can we change? So you can get there without coming in as if you know everything, um, which we mm-hmm. don't. Um, and it is so different. 
now to be raised even before the pandemic. You know, they were raised, you know, they're coming up in a completely different world. And then we have some conflict management tips that we give them, you know, and we talk about us, you know, not perfection. It's practice, not perfection. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of us were not told when we were growing up how to handle conflict or how to handle emotions and things like that. So we, we use this thing called SEAL and it's stop, explain, affirm, and acknowledge and lock, lock in or lock out. And so we, you know, and I always be in or lock out. And so we, you know, and I always vary, I, I work with middle and high school and they can be a little bit more cynical about acronyms, you know, so I would say sometimes I wouldn't use the acronym or sometimes I would say, okay, I know it's a little cheesy, but it's just a way to remember, you know, again, acknowledging that I was the old lady trying to <laughs> give them some tips. Um, and it's really time to approach somebody, you know, if, if somebody says something to you and you want to correct them or tell them they're being mean, is it the best time to do it in front of five of their friends? Probably not going to get the reaction that you want. You're probably going to get them defensive and things like that. And then explain about teaching kids to be very clear about what it is. I don't like you. It's one thing to say you're being, I don't really like it when you make fun of my hands, you know, because <laughs> kids will make fun of, they'll find one thing and make fun of exactly. it. Yeah. So be specific and then perhaps acknowledge, um, you know, we always talk about to, to kids of, did you do something perhaps the past that that maybe like maybe you shared a secret that you weren't supposed to and then now they're sharing a secret and you don't like it. Maybe you shared a secret that you weren't supposed to and then now they're sharing a secret and you don't like it. So acknowledge and affirm like maybe there's something I did. Um, and then the lock, which is a little trickier is, you know, are you locking in the friendship? Are you trying to work on it? Or are you just going to take a break? Or are you just deciding that we're going to agree to <laughs> disagree and maybe we don't need to be friends right now? And to stop part. That is a win, even for adults. That's something that I've worked on. I used to like want to get fired up in the moment and argue mm -hmm. every point. And now I've learned, stop, this may not be the right time and place to do this or things like that. So working on those things. And also that is, again, that upholds dignity of both sides. You're affirming that mm -hmm. you may have, again, that upholds dignity of both sides. You're affirming that mm -hmm. you may have done something. You're asking, you're explaining very clearly. You're maintaining your own dignity. I'm explaining what I don't like. Then you're also affirming that or acknowledging that maybe I could have done something on the other side rather than it becomes, oh, that person's awful, terrible, horrible. There could be something else going on there. Sometimes the moment between kids that we catch as teachers, in particular kind of at the younger ages, because it's easier to see it a little bit then they get they get a little savvier as they get older but a lot of times mm -hmm. we'll do two things we'll either tell the kid that is the victim of um the meanness and we use the word bullying sometimes but bullying is a little bit overused sometimes, but bullying is a little bit overused bullying in my head is just much more repetitive targeted ongoing behavior but a lot of times we're dealing with cases that are just kids kind of being mean um or not kind of really being mean but in that moment it's not necessarily ongoing but We'll say to the kid, well, you don't have to be friends, but you have to respect them. Mm -hmm. And that's really confusing them. They just treated me horribly. So what about what about that have they earned my respect? <laughs> like there's no part of that. But if you look at it as like you need to treat them with dignity, meaning you can't seek revenge. You can't go push them back on the playground. You can't start a rumor about them. You can't torture them in some way, shape, or form back. Or form back you have to maintain their dignity, but I get it if you don't respect them and their behavior right now. Now they may earn your respect back if they start treating you well, or you see maybe changes in their behavior. And so I think it is a confusing message to kids of, you know, you don't have to be friends, but you have to be respectful. And so that's one way that we talk about it. And then the other way is sometimes in the classroom, we will classroom, we will stop a moment that we think is happening and we'll say, you know, Carrie, don't, uh, did he say something mean to you or, or did they say something? And, and then of course that puts me in the position of I'm the one who's being, you know, someone's not being kind to me and publicly I'm having to say, mm -hmm. whereas what you should be doing is addressing the person that said it and saying, we don't talk like that in my classroom. You know, that's not how we treat each other with dignity in my classroom. And I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't use that language again or whatever it is, because you're not, you're trying to stop the behavior of the kid that's doing it, not put the person who's sort of, the victim, for lack of a better word, in this instance, uh, you don't want to put them on defend themselves mm -hmm. at that moment. And then if they, exactly. right, they have to say it's okay and it's not okay. <laughs> being a teacher myself, like um, working in schools for many years, I think it's an instinct from the part of the teacher. Like I try to show you that I'm here to protect you. But now that you say it, I realize that at the same time, I put you on the spotlight. At the same time, I put you on the spotlight of being the subject of a certain behavior. And you might not enjoy it as a procedure. 
Well, and it's, and it's of course our instinct because you're right. It is our instinct as teachers to protect the children in our classroom. And so I agree. That was one of those things that part of kind of being, when I discovered this curriculum and this group before they formed some of these little tips that are ever so slightly changing. And so Rosalind has been doing this for 20 years and I probably discovered mm-hmm. her 15 years ago. And so it's really helped. It really helped me over time um, in the schools just shift my language a little bit and shift how I talk to the students a little bit. And then also that piece of that other side, there's how I talk to the students a little bit. And then also that piece of that other side, there's always another side, you know, there's always mm-hmm. another piece. I mean, sometimes I tell kids, they would come to me about something as the school counselor and I would listen to their, when I first started, I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go get that <laughs> other kid and I'm going to be so mad. And they're so, you know, what did they do that? And this whole other thing had happened, you know, where the, the you know, the first child hadn't been nice either. So I would say to kids, what would, what's the other person going to tell me? What am I going to be surprised to hear? What would their perspective be on this story so that I know going into it, um, just so that I can help both of you? Because I am not there to take sides. I'm there to help both of you. Because I am not there to take sides. I'm there to help both of you work through this conflict together. Um, because kids are going to be in conflict. Adults are in conflict. You know, conflict is inevitable. Mm-hmm. But how can we make it less um, hurtful and less demeaning? And how can we not strip dignity when we're in conflict, mm-hmm. how do we not take in and, you know, calling them names? And they don't have a lot of examples of that. Most of the examples they see online are not great these days. Yeah, exactly. So as teachers or school leaders or school counselors, how can we reinforce the sense of dignity in our students, both for themselves and from, and from others? Can you give us like a list of very practical tips that somebody yeah. can go into their school tomorrow and start applying? Yeah, I mean, yes. So I look at it as modeling as well. I mean, so some of the tips that we've already talked about first is, well, it, let me give you a, a visual. How about that? Because it's one of my favorites that we use a lot. Because I think, and again, the difference, we have a continuum that we sometimes share. And on one end, it says young people as objects. You know, the middle, it's young people as recipients. And on the far end, it's young people as resources. So in schools, kids have to be all of those. When it's a fire mm-hmm. drill, they're an object, you know, get in line. We have to count you, get you, get with your teacher, be quiet. It's a safety issue. You know, so there are times when it is absolutely necessary. Again, you've got anywhere from, you know, 50 to 2000 kids in a building. So you have to have some sort of order. So there's times when they have to be objects. We look at recipients as um, when you're in the classroom, you're receiving some information. It's a little give, it's a little give and take back and forth. You're asking questions. The teacher's the expert in the room. That's their subject matter. And kids, you know, are learning and maybe they come up with a great new way to look at it. So it's a little bit more back and forth. You know, the teacher says, oh, I haven't thought of looking at that way. Great. Share with your classmates, that type of relationship. But the teacher still kind of holds that they're experts or we used to have a thing called character class where kids are the resources. They are the experts of their own lives as they're the resources. So trying to find time in your day to let kids be the resources. If it's not already established through your school uh, day, but if you are a homeroom teacher, what do they want to talk about? What are they listening to? You know, make a homeroom playlist, you know, little things like that. What, what's their favorite video game? Play it with them. You know, little things like that where they get to be the experts and tell you about their day to day. So looking for those is the first place. And try not to judge or have the judgy face. I used to tease kids sometimes. I'm like, they'd say something, my face would go. I tease kids sometimes. I'm like, they'd say something, my face would go. And I was like, I'm not judging. I'm just thinking for a minute because that's so different of how mm. I've looked at something or done something. Um, I used to really judge TikTok. <laughs> I have two teenage <laughs> daughters. I have, I have an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old, and I would get really frustrated. I don't have TikTok. But they would always, and and they were like, mom, you have the judgy face. You're being judgy. And finally I said, tell me, I know there's silly videos, but tell me what else you like about it. Because they would quote kind of news or things about it. I'm like, did you learn that on TikTok? That's not real. So they sat me down and went through their resources. And there are news outlets that are legitimate that are using TikTok resources. And there are news outlets that are legitimate that are using TikTok as a way to interact they have learned a lot about the war in, you know, in Ukraine. They're giving me things. And so I had to back down a little bit and say, okay, it's not how I choose to receive my news, but I understand. And then we talked, we had a great conversation about making sure legitimate source and check other sources compared to it and things like that. So 
It's a great way that you can do that with your students. If you're not a TikTok user, you know, you can go in and be like, I hear this crazy thing called TikTok, you know, show it to me. What do you love about it? Asking them mm -hmm. their perspective. And then I would also say not demonizing what they do, a lot demonizing what they do. A lot of times we tend to do that with technology in particular. You're always on the phone or you're always doing this. Um, I had a student recently tell me that when parents or adults say that to them, it just shuts down because sometimes that's, he has a hard time talking to his friends in person, but he might share what's going on through his phone because the face-to-face -face is just uncomfortable because boys aren't always allowed to do that. You know, sometimes we tell boys they can't share their feelings. So he, mm -hmm. he's like, I'm more open than I would be because I'm able to do it on my phone. And so it's really important for us to make sure that we're not just throwing it all out. And also we use our phones. So, you know, kind of also tell them, so, you know, kind of also tell them what you like about technology or what your interests are. Those are also appropriate shares, you know, like I, I love Facebook cause I get to see my college friends and their kids. Or, you know, I like TikTok too, because the videos are hilarious, whatever that is that you can share with them. Um, so that's one way I would say of bringing dignity, because dignity is also building that relationship and building that rapport. So that's a really simple way to start because kids, again, also in that moment, they're feeling seen and heard and not judged. Exactly. And those and accepted, are- accepted, really, yeah. Yes, and accepted, yes, thank you. That's even better. And accepted because you're not telling them they're wrong and you're giving them mm. a moment the authority they don't get a lot of moments to be the authority um, in school and that's okay but finding small pockets uh, so that would be my most like my biggest most simple way to do it and sometimes it's hard because you're tired in the morning you're trying to set up your day but if you do have those few minutes with kids in the morning it's great to do that um and it and is a, um because i used to like, without knowing to do that um and it and is a um because I used to, like, without knowing like that it, it could be, you know, a bigger thing, I used to do that out of genuine curiosity of what is yeah. going on with teenagers when I was teaching teenagers. And soon, soon I realized that it is a relationship. Like if you show them interest in TikTok to, fo to follow with the example we use, they might come to you with something else that they saw online or something, a new kind of trend that catches up. And you are definitely more able to protect them and um, show them that not everything that they feel they will come to you with something, even Absolutely. if they are not sure that you will um, approve of it. Well, what they've learned is that you're a non-judgmental place. So you, they could come to you with any problem, even if they've messed up and they're not as afraid that you're going to judge them. And mm. that's, that's where you want. And that's, that's where you want them to come. You know, I, that's, that's where we want to stop them from those bigger issues. Cause I, you know, we would have some discipline issues and sometimes they get so far that something major has to, a consequence has to be really big. And if we had just been able, a kid had felt close enough to someone to maybe bring it up out of it a little bit better. And again, restored that relationship, but sometimes it goes too far. And so trying to, you're right. You and I are sound similar a little bit. I used to do that. Part of it was just because I, you work with kids for a reason. You know, you like them and they're funny and they share silly stories. And you kind of underestimate what that rapport building is doing. And you kind of underestimate what that rapport building is doing. But you're giving mm -hmm. them a space to land. And it is confusing to grow up now. Gosh, I can't imagine. I going, cannot even imagine. I cannot even imagine. Right now and all of these things. And I've seen it in my own children. They've really, really struggled through my oldest in particular, just hit her hard. That, another kind of piece of that is seeing her and then also um, this very wise student that I keep talking about. I'm working with the school right now. We're meeting every uh, week. He's fabulous. I wish I had him as a student. But one of the things he said that has meant a lot to him and would help again, with that dignity piece is he has a hard time sleeping. Again, with that dignity piece is he has a hard time sleeping sometimes and, you know, okay. just stuff goes on in his life. He gets stressed. He tends to think about it at night. And he really appreciates the teachers that don't come down on him when he is off for one day, you know, when he's tired mm -hmm. one day and not as communicative or not as participatory in class, sometimes teach really make me want to chime in or speak up he said but it's the teachers that kind of let it slide and know he's still doing his work and he's okay and then one step even further he said if a teacher reached out and just asked me how i was doing he said even if i would never tell that teacher how i was doing 
the fact that they asked me meant so much to me meant so much, you know, that just meant that they noticed a difference again, seen, heard, accepted, you know, like that's really what building that culture of dignity is about. And it was really interesting for him that one piece that he put on there, even if I would never share with them, just having them ask really was meaningful to me. So those are little ways of, you know, everyone's story, everyone has a story when they walk into the building that day. And, and sometimes I would talk to kids about that. If they said, Oh, my friend snapped at me or this happened. And sometimes it's like, you don't know what, maybe their mom yelled at them on the way out the door, or maybe their parents Mm -hmm. were fighting on the way out the door, or maybe their dog is sick. You know, there's, you know, just trying to be gentle and give people a a pass for that moment of, of, I'm going to give this a minute (laughs) and see if this is just a moment in time. Um, rather than assuming that a kid hates your class and they're being disrespectful, you know, it's my class yeah. and I need to yeah. attention. Be like, wow, they might have something else going on. These kids have a lot on their plates. He could mm-hmm. just be tired today. So shifting that mindset ever so slightly. And then to the last third, shifting that mindset ever so slightly. And then to the last third thing that I would say, because these are kind of, I, I think they're easy, simple transformations a little bit. I know they feel bigger, but I would just say the modeling of, Teachers can get frustrated and cranky a little bit with fellow teachers or students, which I completely, which I completely get. I did as on well. On the school system, on the school it, system yeah, in the, general. Absolutely, absolutely. The way the school works. Yes, and so trying to model kind of grace and forgiveness and uh, and dignity. And I did not work in a public school system. I worked in a private school, but I had public school teacher friends, and the it's a, big, a lot of red tape. I have such empathy also for people that work in the system because it's so big and hard to change, but it's, I also understand the frustration. So trying to just lead by example of maybe a teacher didn't do what they were supposed to do for you. You know, you were working on something together, not talking about you, you know, you were working on something together, not talking about them and not letting kids know like, well, Mrs. Smith was supposed to do that, but I guess I'll do it today. You know, we take for granted those little comments of under our breath, kids hear and see everything we do. (laughs) They are watching us. They're also listening to us. And so working that out about venting versus gossip, there are times when you maybe need to vent to a friend of just, I got to get this off my chest. That is much more different than talking about another teacher in front of kids or to another teacher kind of harshly. Those are, you know, coming home to my husband and be like, oh gosh, this was a frustrating day because so-and-so didn't do their part. That's a safe space. Oh gosh, this was a frustrating day because so-and-so didn't do their part. That's a safe space. At school, creating some negativity and talking about a teacher that maybe we don't like or didn't do their part or whatever it is, is not creating an environment that we're modeling for our students. They see that and they're like, what you expect me to be this person. And I used to get frustrated in these team meetings where a teacher would make, or let's just for a horrible example, like a racial comment and everybody would be up in arms. And I understand that that is not acceptable. And I agree. Yet I think adults have a hard time having these conversations. And so if we're not able to model how to have conversations about these tough topics, we need to help this child understand what, what we need to help this child understand what, what let's not assume that this child is a horrible human being. We maybe haven't set up a good example of how to have healthy, hard conversations. You know, those are ways to like model rather than flying off the handle at situations or whatever. Talk to me more about that. How does, why do you say that? I'm having a hard time because that's a, you know, that's gotten me really upset because that word is really triggering. It's a very strong word. Tell me more about it. And so trying to take that pause, whether it's with a colleague, um, a, a kid, and modeling that for your students, I think is helpful. And it's hard. It, it is, is hard, hard to do because there are those triggers. And if raised my voice and I was very upset, and then I called the kids back in later and I was like, look, I'm sorry. It, it triggered me. And this is, let me tell you why you know, this is a really hard topic. And this is something I felt like you guys weren't taking it seriously. We were talking about uh, sexual assault and they were kind of making jokes because they're teenagers and that's, they're uncomfortable exactly. and they are deflecting, they are deflecting. And I know all those things in my counselor brain, but I'm also human. And I was frustrated that they weren't taking that moment seriously. So modeling, come back in, let me apologize in front of all of you for losing my temper a little bit. And here's, let's talk about why. And then they were able to say, yeah, we get it. You know what? We're sorry too. And they, and they said we were nervous. I didn't know how to use those words and things like that. So I think that modeling piece is, is huge as well. Definitely. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. 
of course, I want to point out what you said now um, towards the end of your answer that we are humans. Teachers are humans. Yes. They make mistakes. They get off. It's you know sometimes you don't expect to hear what comes out of their mouths. So it is okay if you didn't react well in the first place. But we should always go back. Like we can't leave. Uh, if we feel that we didn't model the behavior we want the students to model, we really really want to go back. Want to go back even if this means like in a week's time. Yes, um, yes. when you've got some space from it um, and can put some perspective on it. But yes, I think that it is, thank you, because we are human. And it was, I think in particular now, teachers are under such a microscope. Um, there's so mm -hmm. many people wanting to chime in about curriculum and different things, and you should be doing this more. It's overwhelming. And we're working, we are finding that we're working with teachers a lot on their own social, emotional learning and well-being because mm -hmm. we're expecting them to be there for kids and their emotional spaces and they're not feeling strong themselves you know so i really want to just put a stamp on that of like let's so i really want to just put a stamp on that of like let's let's really be empathetic for teachers because i got out of schools when my daughter came to my school i decided that maybe it was some good space to mm -hmm. have and it was right before the pandemic. And gosh, I cannot imagine. I did a brief uh, sub during the pandemic and it was so, are, are again, dealing with stuff that is unknown. A lot of Definitely. pressure on them. And and they're struggling themselves. Like we have to, you know, it's not just affecting kids. This is the emotional- no, They went through the pandemic as well. Yeah. Themselves, as people, as you know. Teachers, I think we ask a lot from teachers. Yeah. We ask a lot from school leaders. We ask a lot from teachers yeah. we ask a lot from school leaders and we sometimes we forget that they might be overwhelmed in this months of teaching so it's very hard for them to focus sometimes on other issues outside their teaching yeah. the what is happening in the classroom this social emotional learning piece that we're hearing about is to really we have to give it time into the mm -hmm. school schedule. And I think a lot of times they want teachers to be social emotional learning experts, which they not, are not always. Although I always say teachers are doing it anyway because they're interacting with kids all day, but they sometimes feel overwhelmed that they don't have the training. They sometimes feel overwhelmed that they don't have the training to do it. And like, it's one more thing on the plate. So we, if we find this to be important, which I of course think it is very important in the school. Me too. And I think we're Me recognizing too. that. I think we have to really find time within the schedule and within the day to give teachers that moment to let their within the day to give teachers that moment to let their I always say like put on a different hat. They don't have to be the expert hat. They get to be the like relationship building person and whatnot. So I really would call to administrators a little bit of if you think it's important and in your school, which it is, to give it time and give it the space it needs. Yeah. I could agree more. And in my opinion, I don't know if you agree with me, with the um, amount of work, the curricula nowadays, all around the world, the curricula that are imposed to teachers, they ask them to do a lot of things in a school year. So teachers do not really have the time for a single kind of day or period in the day where the the students would also relax and share more. Wow. We run behind schedules and exams and curricula and units and whatever whatever they call it in every country. Yeah, and I think that that is, is working against us. There are some schools that are doing it well where they've realized that they integrate more downtime and more transition time. They may lose some classroom time. They actually might lose some instructional time, but it hasn't affected the outcomes you know the ap scores or the whatever yeah, the academic at. yeah because you're really, you, want to be. you are really creating a, a better learning environment you are saving yourself if you can set some of this time up and build that relationship you're you're helping the kids perform better they feel safer they feel more comfortable they do all these things you're able to get through probably a little bit more curriculum because you're not fighting against maybe so much stress and anxiety and so it's really i think it's counter stress and anxiety and so it's really i think it's counterintuitive to keep for some people, but stop adding things on to get more things done. It's almost like take mm. things away to accomplish more, which mm -hmm. I know can stress out some people. Cause that, you know, that we say that we want this, but then parents demand more academics or schools promote this. And I say that we talk healthier yet. We're going to keep uh, amping up the expectations and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
great. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm still, you know, trying to make up my mind on uh, things like that. I mean, how we can better structure. That's why we do have these discussions with people like you. And we're very, very grateful to have had you. Uh, in, we're very, very grateful to have had you uh, in our podcast. That was a super interesting discussion. We learned a lot. So, yeah, I'd like to thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I had a great time. I could talk about these things all day, every day. So I appreciate that. I know. Thank <laughs> you I'm so much. You're a fellow teacher and we can talk about things. I hope to speak to you again in the future, maybe for another one, maybe focusing a little bit more on bullying. And because I found what you said earlier about the repetitive behavior uh, versus the one every now and then uh, yep. bad behavior that a student can um, show. Very interesting because, yes, I show. Very interesting because, yes, I do feel that sometimes we overuse words like bullying and this is counterproductive. Yes. And if kids stop listening, they're like, oh, it's not bullying. You know, they're, they're those words that kids just roll their eyes when we use them and or mm. they get us a rise out of us because they call it bullying. And then everyone gets instantly fired exactly. out of us because they call it bullying. And then everyone gets instantly fired. Exactly. They know that's a that's a trigger word for the adult. So yeah, so we try not to use that word a lot unless it truly is bullying. You know, of course it mm. exists. You don't ever say it doesn't exist. Of course, but, of course, yeah. of course. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.